One of the important differences between MD allopathic medicine and DO osteopathic medicine is the hands-on portion about it. There's the philosophical difference which we've talked about before, the body is a unit, the structure and function, they're interrelated, and the body is self-healing. But we're also given uh, about a thousand hours of hands-on diagnosis and treatment in our medical school training that we can use to help patients overcome certain disease processes. So one of the things that we learn is the stru uh, physical structural exam. And this is an interesting thing that I do teach to a lot of DO students, but I have my DO students teach the MD students because we're not using our hands anymore in the aspect of medicine. So part of the structural exam is looking at a patient's posture while they're standing, what, they, what their gait like is when they're walking, and also how, what it is like when they're sitting. So Larry, if I can have you turn facing that way and look over here, we can see just from a structural standpoint, you know, Larry's right shoulder is dipping down a little bit. So you can see maybe the right shoulder is slightly dipped down, so there's a little more tension in his trapezius muscle here, some of the rhomboid muscles here. You can see how his neck is kind of side bending off to the right slightly, which causes a little bit of rotation that you can sense and feel of the tension in the muscles there. You can see here's the edges of his scapula, how his, the right side is a little higher, and then working his way down through the spine. So again, we're just, we do this on every single patient that we treat and put our hands on to see how their body is adapting to whatever disease process they have, whether it's having someone having back pain, shoulder pain, Crohn's disease with some GI issues, their body, their structure is gonna behave in a certain way. Larry, I'm gonna do a test on you called the standing flexion test. So why don't you bend all the way forward, try to touch the ground here. So right now I'm kinda gauging motion of a sacroiliac joint and come back up. And I would say that's a little slightly positive on the right side, so that gives me a little information that his right SI joint is a little dysfunctional. We knew that. Yep. And again, also structures I'm looking at from po anterior posterior view, you can look at them from the side view and see how his uh, structural and everything plumb line lines up. Seeing where tension is, seeing how much tension is down through his legs, his IT bands, his knees, and then going down into his ankles. So again, a lot of times patients complain of maybe they're having right-sided knee pain. But from a structural and functional standpoint, maybe the dysfunction is not coming from the knee. Maybe the knee pain is originating from the hip or vice versa. They complain of hip pain and they're having hip pain because their knee's completely rotating out to the right. So again, if you're looking at the whole system, you wanna see how the system is dynamic and being adaptive to each situation. So this is standing exam, and so why don't we do a gait exam and watch him walk? So Larry, why don't you walk down towards that wall and then come back? So again, you can see how he's sort of tilted to the right with his shoulders. And when I first met Larry, he was having a little bit of a foot drop, and that seems to have resolved. That's gotten even better since the last time I saw you there. You're not dragging it as much, but you can tell that there was a little bit of discrepancy between the left foot and the right foot as he was walking. So Mike, I, I want to tell you this, that um, one of the things I'm worried about is that at home, because everything's carpeted, we have just flip-flops, you know, in the house. And it's sort of funny, you take for granted that when you put your foot in a flip-flop, it'll stay on. Mm -hmm. But when I start climbing stairs, and it's been getting worse over the last few months, um, I lift up and the, and the, and the flip-flop just stays, it falls off. And I'm trying to think, wait a minute, why is it doing that? And I'm realizing that somehow you actually have an active grip somehow in your mm -hmm. foot on this, and this guy can't do that anymore. Yeah, And that's dangerous when you're climbing stairs. I mean, I don't think about it, and I've got a banister, but um, if it continues to get worse, uh, you know, you could actually fall and really hurt yourself. Um, and then I wanted to tell you that when I was in Hawaii, I had a situation where I was sort of scampering up um, kind of a rocky uh, sand, little slope and when I was coming down I mean you know you can walk down something it shouldn't be that difficult and for whatever reason I just couldn't 
stop myself, and, and I just pitched forward and really uh, Skin your skinned knees. my knees, and, and my, my hands are still, you can see these things here, and, um, and bumped my head a little bit. So I now realize, I'm, I don't know, what, what do you call it, balance or brain foot? Proprioception. Proprioception. Yeah. I knew there was a word for it. <laughs> um, so there's motor strength, there's gait, and there's also proprioception, which is like us getting information from the earth and right. from gravity of where we are in space and time. And you know the the foot drop that you're talking about, you're not you're not able to lift something up and then your your shoe kind of yeah. falls off because you can't you're not able to keep that motor tone and that muscle. And these are small muscles we're talking about. These right. aren't lar large muscles. And this correlates with the area in the spine we know that is right. compressed right that we saw in yeah. the cave in virtual reality. And so getting you to be able to be more functional is part of the whole goal of some of right. these treatments. I mean, it's like we take it for granted that our brain tells our limbs what to do and they just do it instantly. And it's like the distance from my brain to my foot has gotten way too long. And I, I, I mean, I literally, when I was trying to look, like I was tide pooling the other day, I was trying to climb on these rocks and it's not a hard thing for a person to do. Mm -hmm. And in my brain, I could see exactly what to do and how I would then move my body to balance, but I was not at all confident that my body would do that. Yeah. And it's like, wait a minute, <laughs> you know, did I miss the memo? What's wrong with me? <laughs> um, and, and, and so that's just from a patient input point of view, something that I've noticed has been getting worse the last few months and slowly, but it is dangerous, and uh, and that's why I'm seeking you out for some help mm -hmm. on that. And you know, some of the techniques from the osteopathic point of view is to help increase the communication from the brain down to the foot, because or or vice versa, because you're getting information from your foot. And any spinal cord injury patient will tell you when they're recovering that you know there's new textures they're feeling, it's, it's a new sensation of pressure and all of that. Mm -hmm of getting information up from the foot, but also you need the motor to go down well, to the, the foot to tell you. the cerebellum has to talk it, to the, yes. you know, which runs the muscles has to, I mean, it's, it's, your brain, it's so complicated. We don't think about it, but you know, you say you're seeing, well, you're not seeing, the visual cortex in the back of your brain is processing, using memory of things as much as it is reactive photons coming in, and then it's, you know, going to the cerebellum, but then it's reaching out to the memory, and I mean, it's an insanely complex thing going on for the simplest little thing like walking. Yeah, exactly, and it's not just the visual too. We like we take cues yeah, from have, sound as well in the inner ear. In the inner ear. So if balance. you have tension in your neck that's pulling your inner ear out of balance, then everything is going to be out of balance. So there's. It is a lot, it's, I mean, this is a good example of just how complex the whole system is with things, so. Okay, so uh, again, what I like to do with students, because most of the time, when you're seeing a patient in the clinic and I'm trying to teach students on how to do more hands-on activity, I think a big problem, not one of the, it's one of the only problems that we have in medicine, one of the problems that we have is we're not, Ha infusing humanity into the medical world. And hands-on exams, hands-on the patient is one way of doing that. We're becoming, technology is a wonderful thing. I mean, we're in a building here full of technology. Larry's like the front edge of technology, but we're becoming a little too reliant upon it right now. There's a lot of information we can gather just from our ears, our eyes, listening with our heart, but also kind of listening with your hands. And if you look at you know, modern medicine, we're kind of typing on computers and electronic medical record, looking at labs and looking at images, and there's a patient behind the scene sitting on the table saying, what about me? I'm in the room. You know, there's several, several people who can testify, and you know, there's somebody that, you know, I think she was a blogger for CBS News, had a burst appendix, and she kind of documented this journey of hers and went through the whole process. And, nine different doctors, a surgeon and everything, and only one patient 
or one, one doctor put the hands on her during her hospital stay. And so, she, I mean, that's just one example, and it happens every single day. I have patients that go see the orthopedic surgeon for a knee surgery, and they didn't even do a knee exam or a hip exam on them of like what their structure and function is gonna be like afterwards. So it's, it's kind of this, we've kind of gone backwards in a way of the bedside diagnosis of getting to know the patient of this one-on-one -on -one interaction. And so I have the, the patients examined, because normally the patient's sitting up on, gowned up on the exam table, but I have them examine them like we saw walking, standing, you know, and all, of course sitting, structure kind of changes. So he's taken the gravity off of the long bones of the femur down onto the feet, and now all the, the information and gravity is coming into his pelvis. And so this is another big problem we have in today's society is this is the posture that a lot of people have adopted. And one of the reasons we have this epidemic of back pain and neck pain is because if you look at the human structure and the human frame of the skeleton, it's not, we're not meant to load the pelvis with that much weight at all times. We're meant to have it distributed amongst our longer bones. But for Larry, when he sits, his posture changes a little, like his shoulder raises up slightly. So this tells me his standing posture is coming from something below, like in the lower back, the pelvis region, because when he stands up and, put, and unloads that pelvis down into his leg, then his posture shifts in a little bit worse condition here. So again, it's doing a sitting exam to see how things change. But the other th interesting thing to note, when he's standing, there's a little more tension in his lower back than when he sits. So if I had to you know, be Larry's doctor here, I would recommend them that get up from the computer and do a little more activity during the day because that's gonna put a little more pressure. And we know from the MRI scan that he has a compression L4, L5, S1 region, which is you know, part of the whole goal is to relieve that compression and relieve that nerve that were there. So can I have you go ahead and slouch forward slightly here and then come back up? Yeah, so I'm just doing a variety of little tests here to see where some of the tension lies, lies in him. And again, using my hands, touching a patient in a compassionate way to gather information. And you can help hone in your diagnosis. Well, I got to say, <clears throat> as a patient, it's actually a two-way street that when he's laying hands on me and talking about what he's feeling, I am learning about my body for the first time at that level of detail. And so then that gives me an intellectual input as to what I should be thinking about as to uh, not only why I've got various problems, but what I can do to alter those problems. It gives me almost like a vocabulary and a, and a body geographic way um, uh, that I would never get otherwise. And so some of that swelling in your ankle is a little different than last time. It feels like it's been getting better. It's still stiff in that one area. Right. Well, this is due to Hollis King, your colleague, Dio, who has been, who I asked to work on my ankle, ankles which were swollen. Um, and he manipulated to get the uh, lymph drainage working better and the venous drainage working better. Um, and ever since he did that, even actually a month or two ago, it's, uh, I have not had the swelling come back. So again, I'm doing a variety of different tests here to see the compliance of his knees, what his pelvis is doing while he's laying down. Is it shifting anteriorly? Is it shifting posteriorly? What the fascia and interconnected tissue within his viscera feels like, how his di diaphragm feels. And again, I'm gathering, as I'm doing this, I'm gathering a lot of information through my fingertips. Like I'm looking with the fingertips to see how far I can feel into the, the tissues. And, you know, he's a little more restricted on the right side of his diaphragm than he is on the left side. So that tells me that his diaphragm on the left side is more compliant and can do, do more descend, descending there than the right side. And, you know, again, this is something that's not really done or this is a lost art in medicine. And people might seek out a DO and have them as their practitioner, but a lot of DOs 
don't practice this side of medicine anymore. And so that's part of my goal is on a national level is training more students to use their hands in a compassionate way and training more doctors to think like back to the old times of when we practiced you know, without computers. Like one of the things that you can do is a really good physical exam and come up to with a pretty accurate diagnosis, but you know, time constraints and other aspects of modern day healthcare have kind of prevented a lot of people from doing that. But I, in, in my opinion, I think it's what patients crave. You know, they want to feel like touched and they want to feel cared for when they go to the doctor and not many people are getting that. Let's see, I don't know. She's the most loose I've ever felt you. Probably because of yesterday. <laughs> Probably because of our Ayurvedic <laughs> massage at the Chopra Center. Yeah. Well, she said that I was quite tight in the, under the scapula and um, in the neck, um, and she worked on that quite a bit. We had a little mini retreat at the Chopra Center yesterday. And each of us had almost a two hour massage, Ayurvedic type massage, balancing all the different doshas we had. And I think both of us had some sort of ethereal experience for the rest of the, the evening. Yeah, so I feel a little like a bit of restriction. Right, right side of his SI joint and some other tests I'm doing here feels restriction in the hip so joint in that area. What, what is the SI joint? SI is the sacroiliac joint, so it's the joint between your, the bottom part of your spine turns into the sacrum, which is its own separate bone, and that's the middle portion of your pelvis. So you have the, you know, your right pelvis, your left pelvis, and the thing that holds it back together is the sacrum. And you can think of all of those slung together with really tight fibrous tissue of ligaments, and then you have the, a diaphragm underneath this. So you have your abdominal diaphragm up here, then you have your pelvic diaphragm up here, and you can think of them both as a balloon that kind of expand and contract. Mm -hmm. They both have to be healthy and moving because all the organs sit in right there. Well, in fact, that's why um, learning, which I have not yet, it's a 2018 goal, is to learn breathing. What I hadn't appreciated is depending on learning like you do in yoga to do breathing, the, comp the if you can have your diaphragm pulled down like this, that's critical for the uh, venous network to carry the trash out <laughs> uh, as well as the water and, and the materials it gets from the small and large intestine. As much as I've heard, 60% of that flow depends on how well the diaphragms essentially, as you say, are contracting or expanding the balloon between the two diaphragms. Yeah, and it's interesting getting back to this, the ancient wisdom. So a lot of times we get into arguments of people, what's the most important muscle in the human body? Cardiologists would probably say the heart is the most important muscle, but I would argue it's the diaphragm because it's the breath that starts the whole life force that enters into us when we're born into the world as soon as we take, take that first breath. The diaphragm is one of the muscles that has the most surface area. The abdominal diaphragm is the muscle that has the most surface area of the body. But if you think everything that goes through, the, through that diaphragm, you have not only some mus muscles like the psoas muscle in that in, attached to the spine, but also you have like the venous system coming up through the diaphragm. Moving the diaphragm helps pump all the, the blood flow into the heart. We have the art arterial system with the aorta going abdominal aorta and also the most important thing is the nervous system it's the main connection vagus nerve is going through the diaphragm to serve the rest of the lower part of the body and all the organs and so the diaphragm is this junction where it's like easy to treat i tell the students a lot you can make a whole osteopathic career if the only thing you treated is the diaphragm you know because it can tie into so many different disease states someone might have copd or pneumonia if you can get them breathing better they're gonna, you're not gonna cure the pneumonia with that technique, but they're gonna be breathing better so they'll be able to heal, their body will be able to heal a little bit faster than they would have otherwise. And getting back to the ancient wisdom, we talk about this breathing and you look at what you do in yoga class and Tai Chi, a lot of it comes back to the breath. They've known this for 
thousands of years. And the more like deep breathing that you can do where you get yourself in that meditative mind state, the better health outcomes you're going to have. So what I'm going to be doing here, we're going to start on Larry's spine, right in the lumbar spine and the lumbosacral junction and the SI joint. So I'm going to be doing a series of decompression techniques. So one hand of mine is going to be underneath holding his sacrum, and the other hand is going to be up on his lumbar spine, L4, L4 L5, and right at S1, and I'm going to be gently manipulating that area. And I say gentle because you have to learn what sort of technique to use. In osteopathic medical school, we learn a whole variety of different types of techniques, from the high velocity techniques, which are kind of exciting to watch and you can hear different things, to very gentle, subtle techniques. And the art comes into the play when you learn what technique to use for what patient. So this is where getting into the whole personalized medicine aspect of things, because someone coming in with back pain like Larry, I'm going to treat very differently from a, a different patient, say a 21-year-old surfer who injured his back. You know, there's it's in. So you can't just have one protocol, hey, hey, this is how I'm going to treat back pain. It's personalized for each individual because everyone has their own dynamic adaptive system. And you as a physician have to be dynamic and adaptive as well on the treatments that you choose. So Larry, why don't I have you lift your, your butt up here. And again, my right hand, right, right hand here is underneath on his sacrum. And then this hand, and go ahead and relax into my hand here, is going to be manipulating and doing a treatment right out of the lumbar, lumbar area. And so I can correlate Larry's story, the physical exam, and also I have the privilege of seeing his MRI in both 2D and 3D. So it gives me a much better visual image in my mind and an anatomy of what exactly I'm treating. So the problems you know, why, why have I done this? It's, for a decade, I've had a series of problems which fundamentally come down to how inflammation over, chronic inflammation over time damages the body, not just one place, but many places. And, and so the inflammation came from this eight inches of my sigmoid colon in which I had the colonic Crohn's disease but I noticed that during the same time, I got um, sciatica pains. I, my, I, I got an incredible knee inflammation. I got harder and harder to walk. It turns out that all that, once you've seen the MRI in detail, comes from inflammation in the spine. But the spine is like, you know, three or four inches forward from where the inflammation, the nuclear reactor inside of me that was removed surgically a little over a year ago um, was. And, and inflammation is not a local occurrence. Um, think about when you have a fever. You have your, your blood temperature is high throughout your body. Inflammation is a long range signaling system that's, for instance, among other things, telling the white blood cells and other parts of your immune reaction system to stop doing what they're doing and come down because there's a problem. But in addition, the inflammation attracts mesenteric fat. So I've noticed that over the last uh, seven or eight years, the percentage of body fat has been going up. And in fact, I've been building up the um, adipose fat inside, not the stuff below your skin, but the stuff that's around your heart or your liver or your pancreas that is uh, very deadly in the long run. It's the sort of thing that leads to a lot of chronic uh, diseases. Well, that's because mesenteric fat is attracted to inflammation. And I had this just incredible little nuclear reactor down here. And as a result, it, it is built up a lot of mesenteric fat, which even though I now have the inflammation removed, the fat's still there. And so that's what I've got to do next. But that inflammation in the spinal uh, column causes when the spinal, you know, the, <laughs> the spinal cord is inside the vertebra, but at a certain point it's got to get out of that <laughs> uh, bone cage 
so that it can go down your leg to your foot to be the sciatica nerve. Well, the little opening it goes through, when we look closely at the MRI, we can see that the, uh, the little hole it's going through to get out of the, the vertebra uh, is itself inflamed. And that inflammation is pinching on the sciatica nerve, which is what is at the base of all of my knee and foot drop and all the rest of it. So fundamentally, it's all tied together. Um, and now I'm in a multi-year de-inflammation campaign, and I'm trying to rebuild my body from the damage um, that it caused. I mean, one reason they look at CRP, complex reactive protein, in your blood, which should be less than one, well, if it's, say, five, five times the upper limit for healthy, that quadruples your future chance of cardiovascular disease because plaque formation in your cardiovascular system is driven by inflammation. And yes, it uses LDL to make the little bricks that form the plaque, but it's it's driven by inflammation. So my inflammation is now normalized after 10 years, but that 10 years of living in a chronically inflamed body has caused a lot of damage across the body. And so I needed somebody with this system viewpoint, but also someone who could do what Mike has done over and over again, which is by just gently using osteopathic techniques, actually, get rid of the problem, like if he can relieve the pressure on the sciatica nerve near the spine, that completely transforms my gait, my, my uh, sense of, uh, you know, being able to walk right. Um, but then I probably am going to have to go through a whole different osteopathic retraining of the brain, nervous system, muscular, tendon system to relearn how to walk right. Um, but it's actually kind of logical once you sort of break it down like that. And, and the DOs are an appropriate adjunct to my MD radiologist and my MD surgeons and my MD GI tract. And then I have a DO that's working on the more or less the system integration of all that. It's not one or the other. <laughs> Have you ever gotten everybody all in the same room at the same time? Yes. Um, in planning, well, <laughs> so in June of 2016 is when I decided from having tracked myself for 10 years that this um, portion of the colon had gotten to a critical phase where if I didn't get surgery, it might very well rupture and then I would get sepsis and while I'm on the road and end up in the emergency room and surgery, this would not be a good outcome. And so that's when I went to my GI doctor who sent me to the surgeon. Surgeon agreed, okay, let's do this by say uh, late November of 2016. Um, and I said, well, you know, I've watched how you do the tumor boards and you bring in all these different um, techniques, the specialist in, in medical um, establishment to look at a single patient for a cancer tumor. Well, why shouldn't we do that for my surgery? And she said, well, we never do, but that sounds like a good idea. So we pulled together a meeting in October, about a month and a half before the surgery, and we had the surgeon and the radiologist, um, but we also had my virtual reality uh, expert who put my, th my 150 MRI slices front to back into a transparent Larry in 3D that we could walk through in the virtual reality cave. We had Mike as, a, as the DO and somebody who really understood the structure inside of me. Um, we had people from design, we had people from bioengineering, and they all sat around for an hour showing all their various parts. Um, we had people actually from the robotic company that does the robotic surgery. And each of them were sharing different things they knew, but integrating it all together in this one meeting.
And that was very useful to inform the surgeon in multiple dimensions she normally would not be informed in so that she's just more prepared to, for me, the individual me, when she gets inside and starts having to cut things. And she got uh, Jurgen to scrub in for the surgery as well. Right, my virtual reality expert mm -hmm. then ended up in the operating room so that they could have this transparent 3D Larry for the first time ever in the surgery here uh, as a guide as they were going around doing this fairly complicated five-hour surgery. So what are you feeling, Mike? Well, I'm feeling the whole goal of osteopathic treatment is to restore motion and restore function. So I don't know if you can feel it, but I feel like your lower back is released a little bit and is able to rotate a little bit more. And I'm not looking for you know miracle cures here. Right. I'm just looking for small increases in range of motion, decompression in certain areas. So each individual unit of the uh, spine and the lumbar spine can move a little bit more. And there's, if there's more motion, you know there's less dysfunction in any system. So whether it's the musculoskeletal system, and then also for the visceral system. So, you know, I had the pleasure of feeling you with the, your quote unquote nuclear reactor here before, and now, especially after all the treatments from my colleague, Dr. Hollis King, I can feel that a lot of the adhesions and scar tissue and everything that you had has dissipated. And this is a lot less. I mean, you were very, a year and a half ago, you were very guarded you're inflamed here, it was very painful. I wasn't able to palpate as deep into the deeper layers of fascia here. This feels much, much better than before. Well, the amazing thing was, of course, after the surgery, there were a lot of these internal adhesions, which happen typically with any surgery, uh, like that abdominal surgery. And um, <laughs> I was fortunate enough to get one of the top DOs in the country that does visceral massage uh, Dr. Hollis King here at UC and UCSD, and uh, I've now had 13 visits with him where he has done this deep visceral massage, and essentially all of those adhesions have dissolved and have been carried away by the blood system, and they're just not there any longer. And so I have a much more pliant um, abdomen. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot less tension there. And again, if you think from chronic disease state, people that have multiple surgeries, their scar tissue inhibits them breathing, and that can lead down the road to a whole number, host of issues of things. So hats off to Hollis King and treating you. Hollis is the other one that we you interviewed, the other one as well. Well, and the nice thing about this is um, here in uh, Cal IT2's Qualcomm Institute uh, at UCSD, this whole building is, is set up to do cross-disciplinary work. And we have a whole floor uh, devoted to uh, what's called EPARC, uh, which is a physical therapy um, system that's using digital readout uh, for both things like getting on the bike and doing on the treadmill and uh, doing resting metabolic rate, doing peak VO uh, when you're um, running, um, uh, and then also 2D uh, DEXA scans, so you're getting, you can read out the full uh, 2D skeletal and muscular state, not just one little number. Um, and then Mike has come in, and we now have this exam, DO exam uh, capability in here. And our director, Ramesh Rao, has done a lot of work with uh, the vagus nerve and vagus stimulation and heart rate variation, because all of this is digital. Um, and that's what we're about here uh, in the Qualcomm Institute, is, is looking at how these bringing digital capabilities to things like medicine can help be transformative. And now Dr. Hollis King has actually got an NIH grant for um, looking at um, uh, neurodegenerative diseases like Parkinson's. 
And so he's having his Parkinson's patients come here and be tested with this state-of-the-art sets of equipment that we have um, so that we can actually both compare across patients but also get longitudinal time series on individual patients and see how they're improving or, or, or getting worse. Yeah, this, uh, this being treated in this treatment table in this room is kind of like a interesting intersect of the art and science, right? This is the ancient art of laying hands on the patient, which is as ancient as time, but we're in the, one of the most technological buildings in all of San Diego and Western Hemisphere here, and we can start quantifying some of this. You know, I mean, it's kind of like the dream is to have somewhat of a living lab here where we can do treatment on patients, but collect the data before, during, and after and see what some of these outcomes are. And, you know, Larry's been very instrumental and helpful in helping shepherd this through and, you know, putting his own body through the process. Somebody's <clears throat> got to go first mm -hmm. and just demonstrate what it can do to help. Um, so for instance, if I had a chest strap on right now, which we do with a lot of patients here, um, that can measure not just the heart rate, your pulse every um, minute, say, 60, 60 times a minute, uh, but um, actually the heart rate variation. What is the actual time between one peak and the next peak of the heart rate and that measures directly the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. Well, if we'd had that on while he was treating me, it turns out that the visceral um, uh, intestines and everything else are pretty dominated by the parasympathetic. And so it's very likely that we would measure the parasympathetic coming up relative to the sympathetic nervous system, which, is the same, which you have both throughout your body during his treatment. So we literally can get a readout of how the body is readjusting itself in terms of the nervous system, which is of course sending to the brain, the brain that is sending out to all the endocrine systems and everything else as the treatment proceeds. That kind of detailed readout of what he's actually, what Mike is actually doing to my body uh, is rarely done and, and, and that gives us a much more mechanistic understanding of how this sort of magic of the hands turns into being real physical phenomena within the body. And you mentioned the parasympathetic nervous system. So the technique I'm doing here is to relieve pressure on the vagus nerve. And vagus nerve can actually be palpated in different areas in the body, but if you look at the cranial skull and cranial anatomy, the vagus nerve comes out of jugular foramen right at the intersection between the occiput and the temporal bone. And you can actually palpate that area. So people that have tense areas in the suboccipital region of their neck might have vagal nerve compression. And if you compress the vagus nerve and it becomes irritated, you can just think of all the different organ systems that vagus innervates, the heart, thyroid, the heart, the lungs, the entire GI system, liver, like the entire overall inner workings of the body is controlled by one particular nerve coming down. So it's always good to check and make sure that each side is equally balanced as you try to make that balance happen in the system of the patient. And what Larry mentioned about him being kind of wired in as I'm treating him is one of our overall goals of working together is, you know, making this happen more and more. And as we go through this next year, and Larry talked about rebuilding his body, we're going to be kind of quantifying his journey and how the external structure, his nervous system is responding as he's already getting really good internal readouts of how his microbiome is shifting, all of his biomarkers. So we can start to build a bigger, more clear picture from outside in, inside out of how these systems interplay and change with, with each other. And while I'm doing this as a scientist, of course, to help myself, you, I don't think anybody would go to this level of trouble uh, to um, read themselves out um, over time just to help themselves. It's scientifically, this is a, a frontier area where we're actually for the first time getting detailed longitudinal readouts of, of a human 
And that's so that this will become routine. And you're already seeing this where startups are taking certain aspects of this. I mean, like having a Fitbit. You know, that was a startup a few years ago. And now there's millions of people having them. And they have an ability to read out their pulse by the minute 24-7. Well, you begin to determine a lot of patterns about that. Your sleep is, for instance, one of the most important aspects for your health. Most people don't pay any attention. They, they abuse their sleep uh, and, that, and they pay for it, uh, but they don't know that that's happening. Now, every morning you get up and you can see how you slept, how much rim, how much, and that feedback is, I've, I've known a number of people who've said, oh, oh, I've really changed my ways. You know, I'm going to bed earlier. I'm not having caffeine uh, late in the day. Um, and all kinds of things. Well, that's personal feedback. It's not the doctor telling you that. It's you telling yourself by having the data. And I hope that many of the things we're learning are going to be actually commonplace in five to 10 years uh, in the consumer world. Yeah, and they will be, and we're seeing that trend already. You know, I saw a quote the other day from Albert Schweitzer that said, the doctor of the future will be oneself. And we're kind of entering this era of whole wearable technology and everything. You know, at some point you're going to wake up and say, you know, okay, Google, what's my health status today? And there's going to be it's, it's, a lot of this stuff is going to be happening in the background. You're not going to have to wear a chest strap and be wired for certain things. And you know, it's this it's going to creep into all ex areas of technology. That well, we have, and, but and just take that statement you just made. Obviously, Apple is betting a good portion of the company on being able to do just what you said, to create an individualized health analysis through the Apple Watch and uh, then Google through a lot of the cloud technologies and so forth. These are hundreds of millions of dollars, if not billions of dollars, that were not in the medical profession, that are coming in from the outside. And that is what drives serious disruption and transformation of a field. And that's why I'm so confident that we will see a completely different form of healthcare, not today's sick care system where you only use it when you're sick, but something that actually will keep you from getting sick and will keep you healthier much longer as you age. And the question that's in the back of my mind is what is the role of the future doctor in all of this? Like, you know, all of this information is being bought, brought to the doctor, and most physicians today don't have the training to deal with that vast amounts of data. And, you know, we need to start forward thinking and training our new students coming up of like how to interact with all of this, how to be, interact with a patient who's so engaged, and how to interact with the technology that's engaged with that patient. And I think that's what, where it can be transformative, is that, you know, we'll, we're going to start to see predictive patterns and things emerge before a patient or a doctor might recognize it. I mean, just to put it in perspective, when I came here to San Diego in 2000, and I, and I was from the Midwest, and I was overweight, and I didn't exercise, I had one number that I defined my body by, and that was my weight. And then I started taking biomarkers uh, of my blood and stool, and by, you know, 2010, I was getting 100 numbers, um, say, every month that determined the state of my body for my blood and my stool. And then I used one of the first people to use 23andMe, and I got a million ATC or G, the, the code of the DNA, the human DNA. Um, along my human DNA, and then I got my whole genome done, and that was up to a billion, but that didn't change. What did change was my microbiome, and now a single stool sample taken over to Rob Knight's lab and analyzed uh, is something like, um, oh, 10 billion data points per stool sample. So, and then I've got it over time. I just, I'm just finishing 100 days where I get 10 billion points uh, uh, DNA letters every day for 100 days. So that's why we use a supercomputer to analyze it all. And we, we're, you know, I'm lucky enough to have an institute like this that I've built over the last 17 years and, uh, and 
supercomputer centers that I helped build. But because those are on exponentials, both the sequencing, genetic sequencing, and the supercomputers, that means in 10 years, these things will be affordable on your smartphone. And that's what I hope, <clears throat> that technology gets to the point that's taking care of the legwork of all of this data and predictive analysis and where things are going, which gives me more time to do this with a patient. You know, because you can look at all of this data and yes, you see graphs and everything and you know, it becomes very interesting seeing all of this, but I'm more interested in the person behind all of that data. You know, that's where I think the doctor-patient relationship started back in when time began, you know. If you look at all the healing traditions around the world, they still make treks to go see the medicine man or the shaman. You know, it's a very personal journey, a personal experience. And what's, what's interesting to me is we can use all this technology, but you know, we can still preserve that technology, the, the relationship that, you know, who's the person behind all of this data? What, what can I do for you? Like, where can we serve each other and moving forward through this journey? So how's the neck feeling? A little more balanced now. So again, the, the treatment is to restore motion. So you can see that he's probably breathing a little bit better. He feels a little more loose in the neck and the lower part of his back. I mean, the amazing thing, if you look at my MRI of my spine and my spinal, um, the tube that the spine goes down through and the cerebrospinal fluid is in, uh, it almost pinches off in L4, L5. And I've got this kind of rock slide of my vertebra. And if you look at my MRI, you'd think I'm in constant chronic pain. And I don't feel any pain at all. And it's all because of Mike's very skillful DO treatments uh, over the last uh, year or two. Part of it, but it's also your body responding to it. I mean, so why don't I have you sit back up facing that way and just kind of retest. So again, a little more segmental rotation in the lumbar spine. Go ahead and stand up again. Blood pressure might be a little lowered from the treatment. Yes. <laughs> walk, walk forward just slightly. There you go. Shoulders slightly better than before, still with that chronic, but a lot less tension down through the spine. Go ahead and bend forward one more time and come back up. And a lot more even in a sacroiliac joint. And go ahead and walk that way and come back. So a little bit more, still the same asymmetry. Turn, turn back and come back this way. His toe's not, definitely not dropping like it was before. A little more smooth, but again, the overall goal is to increase that nerve pathway. So hopefully over time, your brain, your foot, that whole connection is starting to become a little bit more. I certainly feel a lot better and more yeah. loose and connected. <laughs> so patients say that a lot. And you know, we got a massage yesterday and it felt different. But to me, from like the science part of my brain, is like, what does that really mean? You know, you get a massage, you feel better. You get an acupuncture treatment, you feel better. But now we can, we're at the era where we can start quantifying what that is and what that means. And again, it's, we're in this realm of personalized medicine because the treatments are different for each individual. So every single person is gonna have their own pathway to health personalized for them, which is kind of an exciting realm to be in. Well, the interesting thing is it looks like we've just been doing musculoskeletal work, but in fact, we know that when you exercise, dozens of different biochemicals are released into the bloodstream, including neuro uh, chemical, including uh, growth, neuron growth factors. Um, I mean, it's, we all have the thing about the dumb athlete, but actually, the more you exercise, the more neurons you build, and maybe the smarter you get. Um, and uh, so you, you also have better tissue oxygenation. And, yes. You know, so it's again this whole system's body experience. And we're, there are all the through. endorphins that are released, which anybody who's had massage understands. Um, 
And then those endorphins are connected to the serotonin and dopamine neurotransmitters, which have to do with your mood and your feeling. So, I mean, it isn't just musculoskeletal. It's musculoskeletal, hormonal, blood chemistry, brain, you know, readjustment of the entire uh, system uh, vertically, uh, rebalancing, and the brain is through the nervous system doing all that rebalancing. So this is what I mean about a multi-component, nonlinear adaptive system. That's what you are, and that's what we just went through is a change to that system. And now for the rest of the day, my body will be readjusting to this new normal, and from there on out, I will be a little different. And by having these treatments, say once a month, you gradually over time, just like with my viscera, no longer adhesions, that took a year, but it's, they're gone. And, and therefore, I'm, I'm healed in a much better way than I would have been if I'd just done the normal thing and not had any of that. Yeah. Well, thank you much. Thank you so much.